from all over the world, we, and welcome to the CEO Connect. My name is Vio Lutzege, and I am a director and head of stakeholder relations at Shake Value Africa Initiative, as well as Shift Impact Africa. And I'm very excited to welcome you all today to today's exciting session. Thank you for making the time to join us. We have had registrants from over 33 countries around the world and more than 400 interested parties to join the session today. But we know that people are suffering from webinar fatigue. So we really appreciate that you made the time to be here this morning. So without further ado, I am very happy to welcome Diggy Barnard, who is the CEO of Shared Value Africa Initiative and Shift Impact Africa, to say a few words to us today of welcome. Over to you, Diggy. Good morning, everybody. And I just want to reiterate what uh, we was welcome, as I know some of you got up early, thinking of our Nigerian community and somebody, some stayed up late in our American community. So thank you again for, for, for being with us today. So a little bit about the CEO Connect. Africa faced many challenges and the Shared Value Af Africa Initiative is creating this platform to encourage open dialogue between our leaders to find opportunities in the challenges we face. This year, we saw the launch of the AFCFTA and that can lift 100 million people out of poverty on our continent. And what an enormous opportunity. The vaccine distribution and availability, huge challenge. And within that also comes the opportunity can we, on the African continent, increase the capacity of vaccine production? Yes, there are many challenges on the African continent, but there are also many opportunities. The Shared Value community globally is celebrating 10 years of creating shared value. And this is the first of two CEO Connect discussions with the next one taking place on the 30th of September. And all of this, will lead into the Africa Shared Value Leadership Summit, which takes place on the 8th and the 9th of November this year in Johannesburg, South Africa, God willing. For those of you that are not familiar with the work of the Shared Value Africa Initiative, our main mandate is to shift business leadership mindsets to create economic value and value for society by adopting the Shared Value Business Management concept as a strategy and create what we call profit with purpose. As the SBAI, as we call ourselves, our purpose is to build the most impactful shared value business network on our continent. And one of our objectives is to become the center of shared value collaboration, where we can orchestrate and build relationships and ecosystems and use the power of the collective to scale and bring about change which brings me to today's topic, competitive collaboration. How do we move past our own interest and become one Africa with one voice? That's also the theme of our, of our conference at the end of the year, One Africa, One Voice. A prime example of the lack of African unity and collaboration was clearly demonstrated in the chaos at the Pan-African Parliament this week. However, once we move past the politics, we see a willingness in the private sector to collaborate. And we as the Shared Valley Africa Initiative have taken it upon ourselves to create these platforms where our leaders can connect and openly discuss collaboration opportunities. 
The program today will be run by none other than one of my favorite academics. A little bit about Dr. George Njenga, Dean of the Strathmore University Business School. Dr. George has a string of applications which would take too long to list here, but please allow me to share what led the SBAI to Strathmore University Business School. It was the passion of the leadership of the Strathmore Business School and particularly Dr. George's deep understanding of our Africa context and his focus on shared value, governance, ethics, and leadership all of which we know are so needed on our continent. And that drew us to Strathmore and still grateful today for the first introduction by one of our SVAR, biggest SVAR supporters, Sandra Ojiambu, then from Safaricom and now with UN Global Compact. George and I joined forces just after the launch of the SVAI three years ago. We both share a vision of a more prosperous Africa and we both believe that we can only achieve that through a collective effort. The vision brought us together to work towards building the SBS to become our academic epicenter of shared value on the Africa continent. In 2019, at the Africa Shared Value Leadership Summit in Nairobi, I was very fortunate to be able to introduce and bring Professor Mark Kramer and Dr. George together. Since then, the Shared Value Africa Initiative and Strathmore created a five-day Shared Value Executive course that's delivered by the Strathmore University Business School. And this year, we hope to host Mark and George during one of our lectures. So today, Professor Mark Kramer is our keynote and Dr. George will introduce Mark. But before I hand over to George, I just want to thank Mark and Michael Porter for creating the Shared Value Business Management concept all those years ago. The force of the concept has seen many businesses revisiting and rethinking their purpose and strategies, taking up their responsibility and provide real and lasting solutions to the social and environmental issues we face every day. With COVID-19 still with us, it's, not, it's now even more important to identify new business models to ensure a more positive impact on our key societal and environmental solutions. And business needs to set themselves ambitious financial and social targets so that we together can create the Africa we want. So before I hand over to George, please now ask if you have any questions during the discussion, Please post them on the Q&A and we'll try and answer them. So now, George, over to you to take the conversation further. Thank you, Tiki. <laughs> uh, it's always lovely to be here uh, trying to bring together our leaders and in a very special way today, Mark Kramer. Um, you've said a lot and deep in my heart, um, I had a little story the day before yesterday. It was about this farmer who grows corn in the United States. And he has very beautiful corn. <laughs> and, and somebody went to ask him, how come you have such beautiful corn? And he said, well, you know what I do? I give the best seed I have to all the farmers around me. Why? Because I know the wind will blow the pollen of their corn into my farm. And if they have bad corn, my corn will be bad. And reading through shared value, um, I thought that's what Mark Kramer and Michael Porter wanted to share we are facing a critical, um, I would say, cusp of the role of capitalism in building a better and greater future society, global society. Mark, thank you for your work, for writing the created shared value, for being the um, leader and co-founder of FSG, senior advisor, being a leader in research, speaking out through your writing and speaking, 
helping consult for impact, for social impact, for environmental change. Um, you've done a lot of work in investing and advising on investing. <laughs> you have been a great professor, Mark. And I wanna thank you for allowing us to listen to your thoughts and your ideas about how we can take Africa and the world to a better place. Welcome, Mark. Thank you very much, George. Uh, what a pleasure to be here and what a wonderful introduction. I think that story of the corn is perhaps the most concise definition of shared value uh, that I have come across. So thank you for that. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you here. I wish I could be there in person as all of us uh, could be together. I have very fond memories of the Shared Value Summit in previous years when I could be there in person. You know, it's really hard to believe for me that it was 10 years ago that Michael and I published the article on creating shared value. And I have to say the path for me has been very unexpected. When I started working with Mike, which is now maybe 25 years ago, we first started working on the idea of strategic philanthropy. And when I started FSG, it stood for Foundation Strategy Group, because Michael and I thought, you know, if we can make <clears throat> philanthropy more effective, we can solve social problems. And it wasn't until we began working together with foundations and then companies that we began to realize that companies have a much greater impact on social issues and the world than foundations or philanthropy ever will. You know, of the 100 largest economic entities in the world, more than two thirds of them are companies, not countries. And if we think about our daily lives, we have much more interaction and we are much more deeply affected by what companies do than by what philanthropists do. Philanthropy, of course, is important, but I've really come to see over these last 10 years that if we are going to solve the world's problems, it has to be with the leadership of business, and it has to be with business approaching social problems as business opportunities, not as philanthropy, not as corporate social responsibility. Both of those things are important. Shared value does not replace them. But what shared value is about is rethinking your strategy and business model in ways that align positive impact for society with better economic performance for your company. And as I reflect back on the 10 years of work in this space, I have to say I am deeply hopeful, but also immensely frustrated. There has been a great deal of good news, but there's also been bad news as well. In terms of the good news, there is no question that the world is moving toward shared value in its thinking about business and societal problems. Different people use different words. Some talk about inclusive business, some talk about mutual benefit, some talk about other terms. But all of it is focusing on the idea that business has a social purpose and that it needs to be accountable to its stakeholders and it needs to ensure the success and well being of its stakeholders if it is going to succeed. There's no doubt in my mind that this is the direction that business and society has been moving and will continue to move. And there is more and more evidence as I've worked in this space that social issues really are business opportunities. Uh, if you think about climate change, you know, 10 years ago, Tesla was a struggling startup that had just gone public at $17 a share. It's now 600 and some, one of the most valuable companies in the world. If I think about renewable energy, 10 years ago, renewable energy was nowhere close to parity with fossil fuel. 
Today, it is more profitable than fossil fuel fired power plants. If I think about finance, 10 years ago, there was far less mobile banking and fintech. Millions of people have been able to access financial services through their cell phones that could not have done it before. When I think about insurance, we have wonderful examples of insurance companies today that are not just spreading the risk across the population, but actually incentivizing people to reduce risk. One of the best examples is in South Africa, Discovery Insurance, which has found a way to create incentives that reward people for engaging in healthier behavior. And as a result, their members live longer and have lower health care costs, and that makes them a more profitable and more successful insurance company. And as I've worked in this space for years, I have found more and more social issues that really embody economic opportunities that I would never have anticipated. We're doing a lot of work now in the States on issues around racial equity. And there was a recent report by McKinsey looking at Hollywood, the movie industry, and how much revenue they have missed because they have disfavored black actors, black directors, black producers, films by black people and for black people. McKinsey estimates that Hollywood has lost $10 billion a year in revenue because it is an industry that was run by white men who were oblivious to issues around racial equity. So we're finding in all kinds of areas that there are business opportunities in each of the societal problems that faces us. And I have seen companies change. I have seen companies and CEOs become inspired by this idea that they can do good and do well at the same time, that they can build a social mission into the core of their strategy. I have seen the impact of that on employee engagement and morale. I have seen the impact of that on leading to new innovations new ways of doing business that make one's customers better off than they were before. And that is deeply, deeply inspiring. I've seen companies begin to talk to their shareholders about their social impact, not just their quarterly earnings. I've seen them begin to integrate sustainability factors into their financial reports and actually begin to draw the connection to explain to their shareholders how investing in solving social problems is leading them to more profit. And I have seen shareholders and investors really embrace the idea that they want to invest in companies that are doing good, not doing bad. You know, it's absolutely astonishing when you look at what is being called ESG investing. So investing that pays attention to environment, social, and governance issues. What a growth industry that is. There are now four times the number of ESG investment funds as there were 10 years ago. Nearly 100 new ESG funds were started just in 2020 a 30% increase over 2019. $51 billion of new money went into ESG funds in 2020. That's 25% of all new funds invested in mutual funds. In 2014, that number was 1%. So you see the growth in investor enthusiasm. And investors are getting very creative. I'm actually writing a case for my course now on a very small activist hedge fund that is called Engine Number One. And they have decided that if they can get ExxonMobil, what used to be the largest company in the world, 
to move from oil to renewables, the stock price will go up. And they just last week won a hostile proxy fight to get three new directors onto the board over the opposition of management. And to give you a sense of that opposition, management actually called a one hour recess during the annual meeting to go out and call shareholders to ask them to change their vote because they knew they were losing. Well, when activist hedge funds start to push companies to do better, you know something has changed. So I say this is all good news, but there's bad news too. It's wonderful to see money going into ESG funds, but we're not really sure what ESG funds do. The rating of companies on environmental, social, and governance performance is very inconsistent and idiosyncratic. It depends on self-reported data by companies that is often not verified and often leaves out the bad news. And so while it's wonderful to see investors care about these issues, we actually haven't yet found a way to ensure that their money is actually going into companies that are creating shared value and making money by doing good. When I talk to most companies, they still see their social responsibility as part of their public relations, not as part of their competitive strategy. And when students come into my MBA class at Harvard, they still think that maximizing shareholder value and not worrying about other stakeholders is their mission as business leaders and managers. So we have not yet changed the prevailing thinking. And so many companies I talk to are simply trying to do remedial changes around the edges of their existing business model rather than actually rethinking their business model in ways that create more positive impact. You know, when you read sustainability reports that companies publish, you think, my gosh, the world is gonna be such a wonderful place. These companies are doing all these wonderful things. Well, I'm sorry to say I'm on the board of a group called the World Benchmarking Alliance, which was set up by the United Nations to track the progress of corporations toward the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And they're looking at 2,000 leading companies around the world, very evenly balanced between those in emerging markets and those in developed countries, and tracking how they're performing, industry by industry. And the results so far are horrifying. Out of the 50 largest electric utilities in the world, one of them has committed to abandoning fossil fuel altogether. And in fact, 35 of them are expected to exceed their carbon targets by 54%. When you look at auto companies, 30 of the largest auto companies in the world, five of them have made some targets or commitments about actually reducing the emissions of the vehicles they produce. You look at 350 food and agriculture companies around the world, 12 of them are on track to meet goals aligned with the Paris Agreement or the Sustainable Development Goals. When you think about human rights and you look at 200 companies around the world that have a major impact on human rights, 90% of them score less than a two on a scale of one to 10. So we have a long way to go. For all the hope, for all the momentum, for all of you here today who believe in shared value or practicing shared value, we have not moved the world nearly enough to answer the challenges. And when I think back on what I've learned over 10 years of working with companies, of teaching shared value, of studying shared value. There are a few insights that I want to share that I didn't have when I wrote the article with Michael 10 years ago. The first one is the recognition that most companies in the world 
are operating on business models that were developed decades, in some cases, centuries ago. And they were developed to serve affluent customers in developed markets in the West. They do not serve the majority of people in the world. They ignored social and environmental impacts because they thought they were externalities. Decades ago, we didn't know about climate change. We didn't know that salt, fat, and sugar are bad for you and your food. Decades ago, we didn't even know that smoking was bad for you. Nobody set out to create a company that would do harm. But as our knowledge of environmental and social issues has grown exponentially over the last decade, Businesses are finding that their core business model doesn't fit with what we know today. And they have a difficult challenge in figuring out how do they change while keeping their shareholders happy, while keeping their employees working and paid. So I've come to see that there are really three types of companies that embrace shared value. There are those that are born with a shared value vision and Tesla is a wonderful example of that. There are others that are doing good things in the world, but with a shared value vision, they realize they can do much more. And so I think about pharmaceutical companies that are making drugs that cure disease. Of course, that's creating shared value. But what many of them are now discovering is that there are ways to provide medical care in emerging markets, in rural populations, where there is not the usual distribution system that they depend on. It requires creating a whole new infrastructure, but they can do it. And then the third category are companies like ExxonMobil, where their core business we now know is harmful to the planet. And they need to figure out how to change. And of course, that is the hardest shift of all. There are a few other lessons I've learned. I've learned that philanthropy and development aid does not solve problems because philanthropy tends to pick a single aspect of an issue and a single organization to try and fund them to solve a major complex problem. And you can't do it by just focusing on one issue. Development aid has been channeled to governments and has been very suspicious of engaging companies. But how can you do economic development without engaging companies? It doesn't make sense. I've also come to see the importance of the CEO's vision. You know, I have students in my class who come to me and say, I'm gonna go into middle management. I love this shared value idea. You know, what can I do if I'm not the CEO, if I'm not running the company? And I used to try and give them sort of reassuring answers. And now what I say to them is, you got to go find a company where the CEO understands shared value. Because it is difficult to do, it is risky, it requires innovation. And if the CEO is not behind it, it's not going to happen. And I have had the privilege of having many extraordinary CEOs come to my class at Harvard and talk about the shared value talk about their company's sense of purpose. And what I've realized is it's not just their company that has a sense of purpose. These CEOs have a sense of purpose in their own lives that is what has made them open to taking the risk to embrace shared value. So I'm delighted to be talking at CEO Connect because these CEOs are our hope for the future. The sense of purpose that they themselves feel and the sense of purpose that they can instill in their company and with their employees is the one sure guide to the innovations necessary to create shared value. And I've also come to see how important it is for collaboration. Collaboration among companies to solve issues that affect their entire industry. They have to work on it together. Or to level the playing field. 
You know, I was just speaking the other day with the CEO of a food and beverage company who said, you know, we want to take out salt, fat, and sugar, but when we did it, we lost market share because consumers don't want that. And the answer is you got to get the whole industry to take out salt, fat, and sugar so that you are not losing to your competitors when you're trying to make your product healthier. And I've come to see that it isn't just companies, but it is collaboration among companies and with NGOs and with government. And I have firmly come to believe that unless government plays a powerful role in moving business towards shared value, we're just not going to make enough progress. So it's exciting to see what is happening and emerging in Africa. The Africa Free Trade Agreement that Tiki mentioned is a great source of hope for lifting people out of poverty, for turbocharging the African economy. But what I think is such a wonderful opportunity in Africa is we have many young businesses and many young and inspired entrepreneurs and many people who have a deep sense of purpose about wanting to help their fellow citizens and their country. And these people can create new businesses that don't have to struggle the way ExxonMobil is struggling to take some old business model and shift it around to something that's good for the world. They can start fresh. And just as Africa was able to move straight to mobile phones without having to build all the infrastructure and wiring that developed countries had to do for wired phones, I believe Af Africa can leapfrog other countries in creating shared value because it is not tied to this long legacy of business that has been done other ways. It has an opportunity for a fresh start and a chance to move faster and to show the world what a shared value continent can look like. So thank you very much for letting me share these thoughts with you today. I appreciated the chance, I have to say, to think back on the last 10 years and try and think about what I actually learned over that time. So thank you for giving me that opportunity. George? Thank you, Mark. How beautiful it was to listen to you. Yeah. Now let's go straight to the point. <clears throat> Underlying your thoughts and passion um, is an assumption of freedom, which the American people and many people now all over the world believe in. You believe in freedom for business and business leaders to make decisions. Yet time and again, we have found that they normally take advantage of that and uh, make capital the main goal and growth of capital. Do you think you could talk a little bit more just short, short, in short amounts of how we can add to freedom the word responsibility for our world? Okay, I know you think about collaboration. I know what you think about the players, the triple helix, that's research and teaching and industry and government, the three of them. How? How do you think we can go about bringing responsibility as a word next to freedom, that rather than just letting people hoping that they're going to find within their freedom the science of collaboration in shared value? Yes, well, that's a wonderful question, George. And of course, you're right that freedom needs to be balanced with responsibility. The biggest challenge I face in working with companies is overcoming this deeply ingrained mindset that if we're trying to make money, we shouldn't think about trying to do good in the world. And if we're trying to do good in the world, we absolutely shouldn't think about making money from it. And that's just wrong. But it's very hard to get people past that way of thinking. Once they do, it is deeply rewarding to feel that you are building a successful business 
in a way that is making the world a better place. And yes, there will be people who ignore that. There will be people who take shortcuts. There will be people who engage in bad practices. And there is a need for government. Again, as I said in my remarks, for all the enthusiasm for shared value, companies are not changing fast enough to save our planet from overheating, to eliminate poverty, to cure the sick, to even address COVID, which has so debilitated our world. So government does need to make demands of business. Government does need to infringe on that freedom and impose on business certain obligations. But I will say that I've met many people who have struggled to begin a shared value journey. I have not ever met anyone who started that journey who ever wanted to turn back. Thank you, Mark. Um, impose an obligation. <laughs> you know, uh, it's a polite way of saying that um, democracy won't work, Mac. <laughs> because whether or not we know it, most of our political parties are based on money, not the good of the whole. Uh, so long as you can raise enough money to get elected, you get elected. You think there's something we should do about the political process of electing leaders who are not based on money, uh, who have not acquired power based on money, but acquired power based on the good they have done for society. Uh, that would be wonderful, and I wish I had a solution to offer you there. <laughs> Look, there's no question that government is a problem. There are very, very few countries in the whole world where we can honestly say that government is looking out for the welfare of its citizens in a responsible way. It's true in some of the Scandinavian countries. It's true to a degree in Singapore. But I would find it very hard to come up with a list of 10 countries in the world where government is playing a positive role. And yes, we cannot solve these problems without government playing a more constructive role. You know, it's funny in the Edelman Trust Barometer, Edelman surveys thousands of people around the world every year to get a sense of the level of trust people have in different institutions. This is the first year where business is more trusted than any other institution, more trusted than government, more trusted than NGOs. And yet we still have a long way to go and business cannot replace the role of government, though it can do many good things in the world. So I think we need to count on business to take us as far as it can. And I do think we need to work to change the political process. And certainly we've seen it backslide in the U.S. as badly as anywhere else. And it is not easy to figure out a solution. Thank you, Mark. Um, I think by accepting to give these uh, words of wisdom, you have crowned the passion of Tiki Banad. <laughs> <laughs> it's Tiki quite a passion. This is quite a passion uh, filled with humility. And Tiki, I'd like to say thank you for sharing your passion with me. Today we have a panel that's going to speak to, um, yeah, Tiki, come on, wake up, get onto the mic, uh, onto the video. We need to see you. <laughs> I to say, I just, I know you can now only hear my voice because there's something wrong with my camera. I just want to say, Mark, just thank you, thank you, thank you for your support. I know it's like, after midnight, probably on your side of the world. So you're welcome to stay with us or, or uh, you know, stay awake. Or, but we're also uh, happy to release you to go and get some sleep. So, <laughs> but George, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Tiki. And thank you so much, Mark Kramer. 
um, it will just be a few minutes uh, for our discussion with uh, this uh, imminent panel. Um, somewhere along the way, we have to find maybe a panelist, a way around the better good, the common good, the common advantage that Mark Kramer has been speaking about. And what better way than to start with um, Adeolu. <laughs> Adeolu is the is in charge of a large insurance company, uh, a finance company, managing director and CEO of Alliance Nigeria Insurance PLC. She's worked in many places in the world. Uh, she's Afro optimist. That means she loves the idea that we can reduce poverty in Africa. She's passionate about the potential Africa can contribute to the goal of the world. Um, she wants to prepare African sons and daughters through teaching, coaching, and mentoring. Um, she wants to bring about the reality of shared value. Adeolu, um, you, you are in the finance world and you know that the finance plays a very, very important role in the success of building businesses and especially insurance in the whole area of um, encouraging savings and safeguarding the future. How can we encourage shared value in a competitive collaboration around insurance value chains in the Africa continental free trade uh, dream? Adeolu? Thank you, George, and, and thank you everyone for having me here. Uh, so what I would say is that uh, finances, personal finances and insurance being a key part of that is, is critical to any individual, uh, is critical to any society. And when we look at uh, across Africa and look at the various markets, Africa as a whole is not doing so badly in the area of insurance uh, when we look at an average penetration rate of about 3% across the region as compared to a bit less in emerging markets generally, but against the backdrop of 8% in more developed markets. And in addition to that, that, that penetration rate, uh, which is still lower than the global average, is not consistent from market to market. So we have South Africa who does well and beyond even the global average with uh, penetration rates in the, in the double digits, 15, 16%. And then we look at a country like Nigeria where I'm based, where the penetration rate is less than 1%. And when you have one in five Africans living in a country with an insurance penetration rate of less than 1%, there is a concern. And why, as George mentioned, after 60 years, is, are the numbers so low? And it, it keeps going back to the, the same few issues around, around trust, around knowledge, around access. And, and these are the, the topics that we as an insurance industry need to address collaboratively, because one insurance company cannot do it on its own. Even one insurance market cannot do it on its own. We need to look across Africa and join together as to how we can address from country to country these issues. Some of the topics that were addressed by Mark Kramer really hit home when we talk about the collaboration and the role that government has to play and business has to play on our societal issues. So if we look at creating this, this safety net across Africa, <clears throat> what role does government have to play? What role do we have to play uh, across the entire insurance ecosystem? So we can look at the environment that insurance grows up in, uh, in the various markets. Uh, where we need to see what kind of governmental processes would really support financial inclusion. Because it's not about insurance, it's really about 
financial inclusion and making sure that even the 40%, if I look at Nigeria, of people living under the poverty line can still have access to the same security that someone like I have access to. And that won't, won't come from, from, from banks or from, from regular banks. Uh, that, that won't come from the current financial models. And so this is what we need to, to, to figure out along with the government. Uh, so if we, and, and that's going around access and education where in conjunction again with the government systems, starting from a very young age, educating our children on the importance of personal finances and the role that insurance has to place in that. And again, uh, although government can, can give guidelines as to what the schools should, uh, the school curriculums, the, the content is typically coming from business. And we see countries, for example, uh, Germany, where I was based for, for a number of years, where there's been quite a collaboration between government and companies uh, along the educational stream. And, and we see the, the outcome of that uh, in terms of really powering the, uh, the SMEs in, in the German space to, to power the, the, the German industry. Then we also look at access with the, uh, along the digital space because many of the people we're talking about and targeting are not living in the big cities, do not have access to bank accounts as I mentioned. And so how do we access? Uh, we, we, we look at people, uh, but in a country, if I again use Nigeria as an example with 200 million people, how many agents can you put on the ground to really reach all those folks? But what people do have in 2021 is access to phones. Uh, whether it be smartphones or not smartphones, uh, there, there's really an opportunity for across all sectors, but particularly in the financial industry, to really access a, a much wider pool of people who don't have access to the normal financial streams. So again, if I go back to, to what I started with, these are the areas we need to look at. We need to look at education. We need to look at access. And we look, need to do it with, in partnership with the governments. Uh, so this is why I'm a big proponent of public par private partnerships or PPPs. And I see great examples of this in, in Kenya, uh, where I was based for the last three years. And uh, we, we have a, a member of, of one of those uh, critical partnerships and on the panel uh, with Safari Common and PESA. So I won't go into that. Perhaps you'll talk about it later. Uh, but these are the kind of partnerships I would love to see also in the insurance industry. Thank you, George. Thank you, Adewolu. <laughs> it's, it's amazing how we are all coming back to some critical uh, solution uh, possibilities. Unity of business and government. Education of the values and strategies of a better society right from the word go the use of technology to drive those strategies. Thank you, Adeolu. Uh, and in fact, you're just right. <laughs> I have to go to the next man on the line in the panel. Uh, uh, and I want to thank you, Adeolu, for keeping time. <laughs> Peter Ndegwa. Peter Ndegwa uh, is managing CEO of Safaricom. Safaricom is a significant player in the telecom industry in Kenya the leading communications company in Africa. Um, it has also been the beneficiary of a very beautiful innovation. That's M-Pesa. And M-Pesa drove financial inclusion, albeit uh, not perfectly, but it moved that from something less than 30% to 82% in Kenya and influenced the whole of Africa into going the telco way in developing a better distribution of cash and finances. Peter has a very robust, uh, bold leadership capability. Um, he's certainly one of the best I've ever met in commercial and business strategy, quiet, 
quietly powerful. That's what I would call him. Uh, when he led the Diageo PLC operations in 50 countries in Europe, and he's what we may call a simple man from Africa, I thought there's something of a gift that we have in Peter. So when I saw him in the panel, I wanted to ask him this little question. How can we jumpstart this technology-driven strategies for shared value? We know that it is embedded in the AU Vision 2063. We know we want a more, or should I say, a wealthy and a happier Africa. We know that you are now riding one of the best technology waves in the world that could help us bridge the gap in communicating and sharing value. Peter, over to you. Let's see what you've got to say. And thank you, Adeolu, for bringing this point up. Thank you. Um, thank you, George. And, um, and uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank uh, uh, Tiki and the Share Value, Shared Value uh, Africa Initiative for inviting me. I've already learned a lot uh, from the passion that I see from uh, uh, George, uh, the, the moderator, and also from Mark. Uh, and actually, it resonates with uh, a lot of the elements that I've learned uh, through my career uh, of, for more than 25 years uh, uh, in corporate life, uh, working for a number of uh, international institutions and working across uh, 50 countries. Uh, so, George, I like your uh, example of the, the corn farmer. Uh, I mean, I come from, uh, I was born in, in the countryside in Kenya. I grew up there and, and, and then went to uh, school uh, here in Nairobi. Uh, then you through universities and then, of course, uh, into college and, and uh, later, um, uh, later working for various, various corporates. But I also really like uh, the, the point that Mark has said about uh, business focusing on solving social issues. Uh, and that's actually one of the, one of the big things that I've learned in, the, in my career uh, across, across many countries. Uh, and, I, and I do uh, passionately believe uh, that actually doing good is actually good for business. Um, uh, because it is, if you solve social issues, you'll have a, a more sustainable business uh, and you'll connect uh, with, uh, with society. Um, the second, the, the other point I wanted to make is the, also to make fun of George uh, by asking me a question around uh, financial uh, services. I thought that question would go into, uh, into banks or insurance companies. Uh, Adeolu, uh, Adeolu has actually responded uh, quite eloquently on insurance uh, and the level of penetration uh, in, in Africa. Um, but, but I think it is true that uh, with technology uh, and, uh, and telcos can play a big, a big role. Uh, Safaricom was only started 20 years ago, so it's a very young company uh, in the context of the, some of the other companies I've worked, I've worked with, such as DIG or PwC, but actually has started to make huge impact. It's the biggest business in Kenya and the region. Uh, it's a ubiquitous brand. Uh, is a household name in, in, in this country. And one of the reasons is because of the power uh, that of M-Pesa, uh, the mobile uh, financial payment platform uh, that was only started uh, in 2007, uh, but as uh, George has indicated, has allowed us to really drive um, financial inclusion from the 20s uh, to, to the 80s. So as we think about uh, the, the uh, one Africa, and we have a huge opportunity to really connect Africa and telcos and financial institutions have a real uh, opportunity uh, to combine uh, the power of uh, technology and innovation uh, to really uh, enable society live better lives. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and, 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 and actually Safaricom uh, really has been successful in, the, in, in this country in doing that. And there are a number of uh, things I, I believe uh, are ingredients uh, of that success. One is leading from purpose. Uh, Safaricom has a purpose of transforming lives. And during the COVID crisis, and I'm sure I will talk about it, uh, we really demonstrated that, uh, that uh, if you lead from purpose uh, you, and, and enable society to do better, uh, the organization does better. Uh, so we have supported this, uh, the, the economy 
uh, quite significantly in the in the past uh, past year on, on on that front, and I'll talk about that uh, in a minute. But just talking about uh, how we can connect Africa a lot more and drive uh, financial integration, uh, there are three opportunities that I see, uh, and and I'll, I'll focus primarily on the role that uh, uh, telcos and mobile money uh, can play. Uh, one is to really uh, democratize uh, how we enable remittances and payments across borders. We know there's a lot of friction uh, across borders. I've worked in various countries in Africa. I know trade is not, is not easy. Um, with mobile platforms, uh, we can be able to enable that. Uh, M-Pesa, for example, uh, has been able to reduce uh, the cost of transacting uh, the, uh, across, across borders to about three and a half percent. So uh, today, uh, the cost of, of transferring money is closer to 10 percent uh, on the, in terms of uh, inward uh, transfer of money. Uh, we can drive better connectivity across the region, better collaboration amongst telco companies, uh, and enable uh, digital connectivity uh, so that uh, we allow payments to be made seamlessly across our continent. And we are already doing that uh, with M-Pesa. Uh, indeed, in the region, uh, in, the, in the five or six markets that M-Pesa is, is located, uh, we, we contribute 33% of the inflow of money into, into the countries that we operate in. Here in Kenya, uh, it is more than uh, 60%. The second, the second aspect is, of course, to continue to expand uh, financial inclusion and, uh, and uh, financial health. Uh, we've been very strong on payments, uh, and we are continuing to drive uh, uh, that even, even further. Uh, we can enable credit uh, to a wider population uh, of, of, uh, who, who don't access credit today, whether they are individuals of, or, or SMEs. But more importantly, we can broaden financial inclusion uh, to, to take into account uh, savings, uh, wealth management, insurance. And we believe with the kind of infrastructures we have as a telco organizations uh, across Africa, uh, we can uh, deploy mobile financial services in a much more ubiquitous way and in a way that would be accessible with less friction and lower cost uh, for, for customers. And the third element that I think is really critical and we've seen it through COVID, is on SMEs, supporting SMEs. SMEs contribute a significant part of, our, of, our, of employment, 80% of employment across Africa is through, through SMEs, uh, and, and, uh, and contribute significantly to GDP anywhere, uh, depending on country. For, for example, for Kenya, it's 40% of GDP is contributed through SMEs, and so SMEs have been the hardest hit through COVID. Uh, we have as Safaricom, we've started to really uh, go after supporting SME, enabling them through digital platforms. We have uh, what we call a business app that allows SMEs to sell phone board, uh, to transact through M-Pesa, uh, to, to use their what we call transacting till to pay salaries, to pay employees, uh, uh, to pay suppliers, sorry, and uh, to do a lot more than just purely. Uh, payments that they, they, were, they were doing before. So we can use digital, uh, digital platforms uh, to enable SMEs uh, really conduct business in a way that has less friction. But that requires partnerships, uh, in, in particular on the credit side. Uh, we are starting to partner with banks uh, to bring a panel of banks uh, and uh, to use our distribution inf infrastructure to see what can we do for SMEs. And not just SMEs, but also micro SMEs, the smaller, uh, um, one man, one woman uh, business. Uh, and uh, we have an interesting product we've uh, launched in Kenya called um, uh, Poshira Biashara, where we separate, where a small business person can separate their own wallet from the business uh, wallet so that they are able to track uh, what they are doing. Uh, so George, uh, I, I believe there's a huge opportunity if we can combine the power of technology and innovation and private sector uh, partnering uh, with others, uh, telcos pa partnering with banks and insurance companies uh, and others across value chain, but also partnering with government to enable uh, policies that allow us to, to drive cross-border uh, solutions. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Peter. <laughs> but uh, I think I'll have to prod you. You have about 30 seconds. Um, I'd like to prod you on this question that keeps bothering me, especially around SMEs and collaboration. Do you think telcos can be a strong platform for blockchain uh, capability to enable uh, credit to SMEs? I don't know whether my question is clear. It is, it is very clear, George. Um, today, we, uh, we see, uh, given the ubiquitous nature of the payment uh, platform, M-Pesa, uh, we are able to see what SMEs uh, are doing. We have uh, a million SMEs in Kenya. Uh, we have uh, uh, 5 million micro SMEs. Uh, we have an infrastructure that allows us uh, to be able to, to use various uh, uh, technologies uh, to, connect, uh, 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 to connect partners that are, want to, uh, to fund and support SMEs, whether those are banks or, or, or others, and, and ensure that the end-to-end, -end, we, we ensure that there is seamless end-to-end -end, uh, understanding of what SMEs are doing and be able to assess the level of credit risk that various parties are, are taking. But more importantly, be able to drive the level of visibility that will allow a more trust of the system. And that's what we bring, a ubiquitous ecosystem that allows us to use technology and big data and, uh, and, and enable anyone who wants to support SMEs. We're also thinking, George, about supporting the ecosystems in agriculture, in health and education that includes a significant proportion of SMEs that, of course, will require us to leverage big data in order to bring that to life. Thank you, Peter. I think you've touched a very important issue, collaboration in blockchains to have visibility of transactors and not always to depend on um, credit requirements for risk or for assets in order to get money, which has been a big uh, difficulty for most of the small and medium enterprises in achieving capital requirements. Okay, now let me go to another question. <laughs> and thank you so much, Peter. It's lovely to hear you. <laughs> uh, let me go to Monica Sanders. Monica Sanders, wow. You're going to talk to us about how a more inclusive and equitable gender policy is critical for growth and a better world, for inclusivity and collaboration. Monica is responsible for developing and advancing uh, sustainability and shared value strategies in various institutions, especially the Abbott Laboratories. And she's worked in Rwanda in a very special project, which she may want to share with us. Um, she's passionate about her commercial experience in supporting more women into business sustainably. Uh, she, she has more than 25 years of progressive management in that case. And uh, how does she do that? By going straight to the strategic level, the, the leadership and innovating the business development to include women. Now, Monica, let me not take your thunder. Why don't you come in and tell us how we can share value between men and women? <laughs> Well, thank you, George. I appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. So um, before we get started, um, just a little bit more about Abbott. It's a global healthcare company uh, that brings life-changing technologies to people around the world. Uh, we have been engaged in, in helping to address the COVID pandemic, mainly through rapid and molecular testing. So we, we can talk a little bit about the, uh, at a little bit later about the collaboration needed to do that on a global basis. But to start with your question, I mean, um, how I would, I would uh, start out is by, by first talking about um, an, an, an article or study that I recently read in um, The Lancet. And it spoke to the need uh, for gender equality to actually help drive healthcare equity. And that's an area 
in which Abbott is very committed. I mean, we really see good health as the key to achieving anything in life. And, you know, as we always say, when you have your health, you have everything. Um, and the studies have shown that the involvement of women and gender equity matters because it can help reduce the, the rates of, of poor mental and physical health in the community. Um, the data talks about how um, equity or equality in the community promotes economic growth, it reduces child mortality, it improves nutrition, and um, um, both this study and a recent study by McKinsey both said that gender diverse companies actually financially outperform their cohorts that are, that are not as gender diverse. And these findings I found um, to be real life examples. And I've, I've, I've actually observed this in the work we're doing in Rwanda. And Abbott in collaboration with the Rwanda Ministry of Health and uh, an NGO partner, Society for Family Health. Um, we're helping to expand access to healthcare in rural areas through a project which we call the Second Generation Health Post Initiative. Um, and so from here on out, just to save a few seconds, I'm gonna refer to it fondly as the uh, SGHP or SGHPs, that's what we call them, second generation health posts. And what they do is they provide primary care, including antenatal care and safe birthing options for women in the community. Now, um, why this is important is because if we actually look at the second generation health posts, 25% of them right now are actually operated by women, okay? Um, and we plan and we hope to actually double that percentage at scale and have um, women run these operations as much as men. Uh, what's different about this second generation health post is really the expanded services as well as the dedicated lab space that allows um, the nurse operators to better diagnose and treat patients. And we're happy to share that 88% of the lab technicians who work in these facilities are women. These facilities, uh, we believe, are, are um, being successful in creating entrepreneurial opportunities and career paths for women. Um, beyond the economic empowerment that we're seeing, what we're seeing is that they're delivering high quality of care. The majority of the, of the beneficiaries of the uh, SGB, SGHPs are women. Nearly 60% of the, the patients are women. And these facilities provide safe, clean, and confidential spaces to discuss a, a variety of gender-specific health concerns, including family planning. And so with that in mind, we, um, what I'd like to say is we're, we're able to deliver this collaborative opportunity, which provides um, better healthcare um, and solutions to the community and, and do so in a way that is profitable. And so therefore we, 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 we have created a shared value. Um, beyond Rwanda, um, you, uh, Abbott, is involved in and in, in, in sees the importance of gender diversity across our work. Um, over the last two decades, we've worked in Tanzania in partnership with, um, with uh, AFEM, and uh, I, I have to remember, uh, sorry, it's 2 a.m. for me, so the brain's not working. I can't remember uh, what that stands for, but that organization is actually founded by women and it plays an important part in training women 
to, to play vital and leadership roles in healthcare. In Tanzania, our, our partnership in particular over the last um, 20 years has helped um, produce a number of emergency room or emergency care uh, physicians, including uh, Dr. Upendo George, who um, I would just like to honor um, for her contributions who actually passed away last year. So um, that's the initial uh, take uh, that we have on this area. Uh, ah, the, the, the AFME, EM is African Federation of Emergency Medicine. And as I mentioned, um, we have worked with that organization and actually have helped stand up emergency room services in, in Tanzania. And those have been uh, uh, largely delivered by, by women. And you found out that women can be very productive sometimes more productive than men uh, actually and collaborate the, much better than men not only do they collaborate much i'm not going to say that uh, uh, because i want to be fair to my male counterparts on the call and i don't want anyone haunting me after this call but um, the creative problem solving um, and the ideas that they bring to bear are, are, are second to none. Um, there is a can-do attitude that I think many of us of, uh, of the female persuasion uh, uh, bring to business uh, that isn't always recognized and appreciated. But in this case, we do see that. Fantastic, fantastic, Monica. Um, unity, collaboration between men and women, um, encouraging us to give a fair share in bringing the common good yeah. in healthcare across Africa. Um, we, 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 we see healthcare as not only, as I mentioned before, an opportunity to create economic growth, and it's through through, uh, through good health, that you then have a healthy society, which can then grow for you the economic productivity to increase um, and lift people out of poverty. So we see it as being a very important one. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Uh, let me go straight. And wonderful for you being there, even though it's so early in the morning. Uh, just keep your belt on and let's see whether you can have two extra hours in the morning when you wake up finally. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. We'll, we'll see, you. but I, as I said, I'm a, a, a night owl, so this, is, this works out just fine for me. Lovely. The next guy on the line is William Price. Uh, William, uh, it's nice to see you here. Um, William has done a marvelous job um, just for you to know, um, he works for Enel, and William Price has been able to congregate, to collaborate in the building of geothermal, wind, hydroelectric, solar thermal, and photovoltaic electric generation. He's about clean energy, and he's about statistics that demonstrate energy can be distributed more fairly and faster and cheaply across the entire continent of Africa. But most of all, what I like about William Price is that he agrees with um, Mark Kramer that um, governments have an incredible role of leadership in this. Uh, William, listen, you, you, you know what problem we have in energy distribution in Africa you know that we are still highly fossil fuels. At least in the cooking, it's still very high. We cut trees. But when you think of petroleum, wow. Um, we want to share value for climate, um, safeguarding the climate. But we also want energy in people's houses, in people's factories and manufacturing. 
and in a better lighted world. Over to you, William. Tell us something about that and shared value. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, George. Thank you for, for having me and uh, thank you for such a, a, a nice introduction. Um, so my, my, my first thoughts is, um, is to, if I had to uh, give some, some comments to, to government, uh, especially around energy is, is take a moment to, to understand uh, the way uh, that energy is produced and the way that energy is consumed. And it quite, it's changing uh, quite a lot as uh, Mr. Kramer in this introduction speech expressed. So the production of energy as we've transitioned from, from fossil fuels to renewables uh, is, uh, has been quite interesting the cost of renewables has dropped and the way we consume energy has changed the simple with uses of, of uh, more energy efficient uh, appliances or even like led bulbs the amount of energy that you you need to light up a community is much less than what it was has in the past so so the the way energy is produced and the way it's consumed is changing so for governments to take note and understand uh, this and, and be adaptive to uh, to the, the very fast pace uh, of this, this concept. It, it, it is, the world is quite changing in this regard. Uh, th then with the, the use of renewable energies, there's, there's multiple use, multiple renewable energies, is it, is it creates a, a, another unique challenge of, of managing the, the variability uh, of those renewable energy resources. Solar energy produces energy when the sun's out, but it doesn't produce energy, of course, at night uh, from, from that particular energy source. So that, that promotes a, uh, a situation where, where there's, there's been a lot of investment and a lot of uh, assessment into energy storage applications and, and batteries. Uh, batteries or energy storage themselves are, are really not renewable energy devices. They're, they're just storage devices that can be charged with any, any form of renewable or any form of energy. Um, so, uh, with that, the governments need to understand the, the, of course, the, as I said, the, how to utilize this, this changing, uh, technology of both supply and demand. Uh, and then there's, from electrical energy, uh, there's, when it comes to shared values, of course, the, the, you know, uh, inclusion to, to the, how to include the population and, and, a, and availability to, to energy. And, and that for governments should, uh, they should invest in infrastructure. They should invest and promote uh, uh, a clear regulatory policy. Uh, uh, government should uh, promote uh, uh, clear, transparent tenders to, uh, for supply of energy and even the infrastructure. As an independent power producer, as an independent power producer, uh, creating a, a tender-based situation where uh, companies like Anel could uh, tender and provide a supply of energy, uh, the, the uh, monopolies of utilities is, is no, longer, uh, no longer required uh, as it was in the past with the uh, evolution of IPPs. Um, and I, and I think the other thing that that uh, that the Africa continent should take a look at is, is energy policies that have worked. Sometimes we we ask ourselves these questions: how how to how to do certain uh, how, how to how to go about doing certain programs, and and you know we, we're a, we're a global world. We have many many things that have worked in, in various areas, not just in Africa, all over the world, but but in Africa in particular, one of the, the programs that works quite well is, is what's what's happened in, in South Africa with the Renewable Energy Independent Power Producer Program. Uh, it's it's a very nice program. Uh, other areas, other countries uh, should, in my opinion, take a look at that program. And, and enhance take take what's worked in that program and, and enhance it uh, for their respective uh, countries. Uh, the, the REAP program, uh, in particular, 
it, it also addresses some of the, the key concerns with the equitable power distribution, even, even uh, some, some shared value, which we're so uh, in this particular conference focused on. The, the equitable power distribution as it promotes uh, rural infrastructure. So you're taking a, a project that you're uh, investing in, and, and it, it also invests in rural uh, development. It also uh, it promotes economic development in the community, social economic development, uh, or enterprise developments where we're creating local businesses. And, uh, and, and, and finally, uh, you know, again, uh, to, to tie this all in with shared value, uh, the, the importance of, of companies and IPPs or, or suggestions to, to government for, for IPPs that develop these renewable projects is, is to promote shared value by, by having clear policies of, of, uh, of having local content uh, and, and encouraging suppliers for, uh, to, to uh, not only uh, utilize local uh, local labors, but also uh, spend and, and develop uh, those local resources so they can uh, uh, support the, the power plants in which we operate. Uh, I, I like to look at it and how I look at it is, is uh, these projects that are operating, how they're uh, we're neighbors with the local community and as with neighbors with the local community, of course, you we're, we work together in promoting the, the, the projects in which we operate. Um, so those are uh, my, my comments. Uh, uh, open to other, other thoughts you might have, George. Hey, very good. Very good, um, William. Uh, I've, I've taken the point about fair policy very strongly and the role of government in ensuring the application of fair policy, implementing fair policy in the tender system and more recently in your conversation in shared content. That is to be inclusive of um, the, 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 the values, the capital, the capability of the local population rather than relying entirely on the company's uh, monopolistic capability or cheapest capability of delivering energy. I, I, and you have talked about monopolies mm, and this can be broken up to be more fairly distributed, decentralizing power and capacity across the continent. One question that would really, you know, sink these two points in is, can, can government help deliver policies that encourage uh, power companies, power generating companies and their partners or collaborators like the telcos uh, in increasing the growth of power distribution in Africa. What do you think of the sorts of partnerships or collaborations other than purely government? I already see that government is a very key player or governments are. But would you like to say something about what you see the future looking like in Africa? William. Right, sure. Thank you for the question. Uh, I, I think uh, the, the policy, there, there's two, especially when it comes to electrical energy. So electrical energy, uh, what is produced is, is immediately consumed. So that's the first just basic concept. You, you can't produce energy and then it, and then it, doesn't go anywhere. So electrical energy is produced and it's consumed. So either consume it or you take the energy and you store it, such as battery technology. So the first thing is that governments should do is, 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 is look at where these, these energy supplies uh, go and, and, and then establish a, this, this I said, infrastructure and regulatory policy, open access, transmission access, so that uh, you, you uh, can provide energy to to different different customers. So right now, how things work uh, with many many uh, countries is you have a monopolistic utility. It provides energy and it provides energy to all. If you had a situation where uh, you you had an independent power producer and you wanted to provide energy to a customer, uh, which is to say a commercial customer, that 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 market should be open. But what it requires is access to transmission. So transmission is the delivery of energy to, to its customer. Just like if you, uh, 
if you had roads or infrastructure, you invest in infrastructure of, of roads into communities, you have transmission to communities. So establish uh, policies and regulatory uh, frameworks where, where IPPs can introduce electrical energy into the network and can be delivered to, to uh, uh, other customers. So rather than having, say, uh, uh, sales uh, power agreements with utilities, you can have sales agreements with uh, a commercial customer and uh, uh, you can supply energy in that, that regard. Uh, so that's, 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 uh, that's, that's key to, to opening up the market and that's key to even businesses. So, so one, of the, the, one of the key aspects with renewable energy that, that's commonly overlooked is is the is the uh, firm cost of renewables so unlike fossil fuels uh, the fossil fuel costs change so if i was a customer and i was a commercial customer and um, i wanted to have a surety of my electrical energy if i purchased renewable energy that cost can be fixed for for typically we enter into 20-year power purchase agreements so I know my cost of energy won't change. So versus fossil fuels, uh, the, the variety of, of uh, that, the energy, the, the fuel that's burned, that cost changes. So if I was a, so that's why the, the, the world is looking is changing so fast into renewables because I, as a business, I know my, my OPEX won't, won't change over 20 years. So it's really versus if I have to worry about such as what's happening in South Africa with increasing energy prices or across the continent that the prices are constantly changing. How do I invest as a business, as a commercial entity with not knowing where those prices would go? So I'm gonna create a large factory and then my electrical costs, my OPEX are gonna go up. With renewable energy, uh, there's no fuel that you're burning. So it's, it's, a, it's a firm price. You know where your price is going to go. You have that, that certainty that you've been able to manage. And, and, with, and the prices, and prices William, yeah. and the prices for renewable or clean energy are coming down? Yes. So the, the, if uh, new, new uh, level, what they call levelized uh, uh, cost of energy, uh, renewables are cheaper than fossil fuels. It's a fact. So that, that transition started, uh, we saw the transition in NL in, in, in uh, 2019, and it's even become cheaper now. So, uh, so if I if if you're a commercial entity and you're you're buying energy, yes, renewables are cheaper. It's just that the the, the challenge is solving the variability of, of renewables, and and there's various technologies uh, that that are becoming more and more available to be able to do that. Beautiful, beautiful, William. Uh, just for the sake of time. Uh, I just want to say thank you. Those are very good ideas. I really wanted to press the idea of agencies um, uh, building uh, inclusivity by building agency that can distribute at the lower level, the energy. Now that, that's a really, really complicated thing, but it's a fantastic idea. I want to say thank you very much, but look, come on, tell us more about that agency plan of yours. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How do we distribute? Uh, at the decentralize. How how do we decentralize a little bit more so that we can include oh. more people in the value chain? Yeah, the decentralization is is, is quite a, a, a challenge, and 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 why is because decentralization. If you look at it, is uh, the if you the, the concept is how to get energy to to rural areas that they're not that they don't have power, don't have access to the grid, and it's very very tough to do. Uh, why is because of the, the comment I just made with, with the available energy is produced, it needs to be consumed or stored. And so if you're, um, if you're providing off grid, which you don't have grid. So normally if you provide uh, power to grid, it, it, it goes to wherever customers that are connected to the grid. And, and uh, as we all turn things on and off, it, it's, it's, it's managed, the supply is managed uh, in that regard. But when you're talking an off grid solution, and you're, and you're providing energy without this, this large amount of consumption, it, it does create challenges and, and, it, and it creates, the problem is, is there, there's the technical capabilities there, but the cost of providing that energy 
is high. And, and that's where, 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 while renewable energies have come down, I think what the, the key aspect is, is, uh, is there has been some, some significant in, uh, advancement in energy storage, both in cost, size, capability, technology, and as that, as that happens, then, then, uh, then, then you take a lowest cost energy of, of renewables, combine that with storage, and then, then we we are getting closer to providing energy into these rural areas. But right now, without grid support, um, it uh, why why it hasn't worked in the past? It's usually you're providing energy to 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 uh, peoples uh, who who can afford it the least, and and off grid energy is the most expensive. Uh, because of the reasons I just explained. So uh, uh, many, you know, uh, including Anel, many companies are looking into this um, because uh, uh, there is a, a significant demand. And, and again, as, as technologies improve, uh, uh, this is, this is a, a clear uh, direction that that uh, as we can apply these new technologies, especially in the, in the form of storage, uh, will, will will greatly assist in, in providing you know the, these these off grid or decentralized uh, uh, solutions or or uh, requirements that that you mentioned. Great, great, William. Um, our conversation, dear panelists and attendees, uh, has looked at energy from the point of view of driving power, driving power. Um, I, I think it would be good that um, we also see it in a more expansive zone of, um, of fuel, fossil fuels for transportation. Um, airplanes, cars, what about the cooking? And what about the biogas that can help in cooking, especially in the communities that are not yet connected to the grid or would find it very expensive to have uh, uh, energy distributed to the homesteads using a very difficult, expensive system that is not available yet uh, easily. Um, yeah, I could say a lot more, but energy is one of the pillars for industrialization. And what William is telling us is the cost of clean energy is ideally cheaper right now. And if we collaborate, that energy can be distributed to another 50 or so percent of the people of Africa in a collaborative way. William, am I right in concluding that? <laughs> yes, you, you, you are. I think uh, this is the, 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 the phrase, uh, you know, leapfrog uh, technology, I'm sure you heard. So, so meaning that uh, no longer these communities, you don't have to have these traditional power plants and large scale power plants. And that was one of the problems where you would want to provide a, a power plant into a, a rural community. Uh, the, the form of energy production is, is burning fossil fuels and that, that cost of, of establishing that. Now you can put a more smaller uh, uh, unit, re renewable type uh, type facilities, and, uh, and and solve it in a, in a different way. So you don't have you can leapfrog the standard form of of uh, energy production that that existed in the past. So take take advantage of of current new new technologies and the cost of those to be able to get uh, energy to to these remote, remote rural communities. Beautiful. Thank you, William. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're very kind. And thank you for You're being welcome. here. Thank you. Thank you. Over yeah. to you, Ian Williamson. <laughs> Ian, uh, let's see your face. Uh, this guy uh, helps run all mutual. Um, and he's pretty expanded across Africa. He's providing capital. And behind him is the capital. You can see in that picture, beautiful capital. <laughs> <laughs> William, William, William. Uh, I think in shared value, one cannot but speak of money, money that is reasonably priced. And wow, do you know in 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 Kenya, um, the cost of capital for SMEs is within the range of twelve percent to. 
36%. And for the working capital, it very frequently goes to 42%. There is no way our SMEs are gonna grow with that type of capital cost. Yet I know that Old Mutual is, is, is a big company and can foster collaboration in thinking about solutions as Peter has said, in bringing capital to the people in an affordable way because 98% of the people in Kenya, and I would say the, the percentage used by Peter was 80%, are SMEs, informal businesses, simple people building simple, almost cottage industries uh, and not large corporations that require uh, the guzzling of large amounts of money for infrastructures and power public-private partnerships. Let me ask you this year. You, you have been here, all right. Um, do you think that uh, we can move away from donations as a solution to the high cost of capital, the uh, inability to have capital quick and fast where it is needed amongst the poorer populations? What, what do you think here? Uh, how, how do we get also the private sector to join up with government uh, to fund large projects that will open up economies? Ian, am um, I speaking? Am I asking? Are you good? I'm listening. I'm listening. <laughs> <laughs> tell us what you think here, please. Tell us what you think. I think it is, it, it is absolutely possible. You may know. George, we, we're a majority shareholder of a microfinance institution called Faulu in Kenya, which you may be familiar with. Um, so, you know, that I think is an example of, of how it is possible through community lending and such like to finance micro enterprises. Um, I think across the continent more broadly, you know, we're not, uh, you know, our, our business as Old Mutual is primarily life insurance, short-term insurance, we do do banking and financing in some economies, but not right across all the markets we operate in. But as a consequence of being a, a life insurer, we are ideally placed to be a financier for infrastructure particularly, and particularly long dated, relatively illiquid infrastructure. And the, the precursor to to the, I mean, let me, maybe let me take a step back. We, we fundamentally believe as an insurer, we have, have embedded in our core strategy statement that our fundamental purpose is to champion mutually positive futures, which I think is at the core of, of shared value. And I think as an insurer, we, we're quite uniquely positioned in the sense that the whole business model really revolves at a sustainable level around shared value. Um, you know, I actually went to Michael Porter's lecture on shared value in 2011, and um, I remember hearing it and, and kind of wondering why we were, why it was such a big deal. <laughs> and it was probably because at that time in my life, I'd only worked in an insurer, and I think we kind of take it for granted to some extent. Um, the... But back to the point around around infrastructure, I think, you know, because of the long dated nature of the liabilities that we carry, infrastructure assets are ideal for our balance sheet. And, and therefore we can provide them, I think, at competitive prices. There is funding available. There are lots of funders that are prepared to provide funding at competitive rates. You know, the conditions precedent essentially come back to whether the the regulatory environment is sufficiently well developed and clear because of the long dated nature you know any uncertainty regarding framework and regulatory environment drives the cost of capital up exponentially so having clarity and certainty keeps costs down obviously not all an infrastructure is an ideal shared value asset because it inherently provides multiplier effects into the community and into the, the job creation, um, et cetera, over long periods of time. 
So in my mind, it, you know, it's an ideal conduit for for shared value and, and a ideal conduit for long term wealth creation because it underpins the the levers of the economy. Um, and partnership and collaboration across the funding providers, the developers of the infrastructure, the regulatory framework is critical. Um, and so that partnership ecosystem becomes important. And ideally, you want a situation where as the infrastructure gets developed, local labor is employed in developing it, local skills are developed, and you, and you, you generate the multiplier effect into the economy that way. So that, that I think is, is fundamentally it. And I, I think the, the core point I'm really making is that if you want to keep the cost of capital down, you want to reduce the risks that that capital perceives. And SMEs in their own right are, I guess, inherently risky to some extent, but there's so many contributing factors to that risk that are actually got nothing to do with the SME itself. It got a lot to do with the environment that the SME operates in and the, um, the, the development of the market. So we've heard a number of speakers today uh, from Adelia talking about financial inclusion and access. You know, what that really talks to is consumer education and what I would call market development. You know, the entire ecosystem particularly for insurance, of the value chain for insurance is, is underdeveloped. In some countries, it's hard to even collect premiums. Um, consumers don't necessarily appreciate the value, your point around the cultural issues. So there's a market development job and market education job to be done, a certain amount of patience required, and a job for governments and regulators to, to work with partners to put appropriate regulation in place that you know eliminates the the fly by night people that that sort of um undermine the confidence in the market but equally create the the certainty for the players that really do want to contribute positively to operate without having to charge silly premiums on you know for their for their goods whether that be capital or anything else um and that's that's the clarity point so George, I don't know if I'm going in the direction you were headed, but uh, hopefully that helps. Beautiful, beautiful, Leon. Uh, you've hit a very core issue there: de-risking the SMEs, uh, uh, building stable regulatory environments that 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 enable de-risking of finance from the private sector, because any of this that is unclear increases exponentially the cost of capital. Uh, the building of the environment. And here we can see areas of col collaboration uh, in terms of helping governments de-risk, in terms of helping SME join hands, in terms of uh, technology platforms, blockchains that can enable the financier to see. I mean, there's a whole lot of things to collaborate here so as to access finance. And with that, I come to the end of the panel session and I wanna thank Ian for speaking to this very crucial issue. Um, wow. So I, I, I can summarize after listening to all of you, my dear panelists who have been very special in sharing your experiences, three things. There has to be unity and collaboration in shared value. Uh, we have to work with government, industry and education institutions. We have to build capital that speaks to shared value. If we don't collaborate at the triple helix area in building capital that will build a better world or finance better incentives or finance better projects, if we don't think of unity for the good of the whole, then we will destroy our society suddenly for the sake of a few rich people. And with that, I come to the end of the panel session. I hope you've enjoyed the ideas brought about here. And I want to know whether Tiki will introduce Mr. William Dax uh, to conclude the session so that uh, within the next five or 10 minutes, we close up. Um, I think it's 10 minutes. We have 10 minutes. Uh, Tiki, are you there? Um, I am here, but I'm not sure if my camera is going to work. Don't worry. I will. 
I, I will. I, I will My camera be... is not working. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So I'm here. Thank you, Dr. George. I just want to say what an incredible discussion this morning from from all of our CEOs. And, and I just want to say I can see some discussions that is already gonna you know come out of this from a collaborative perspective. So so really really thank you, George, and thank you to every single CEO that gave us their view and their contribution because this is the start of many of these conversations to try and orchestrate these relationships between our leaders so that we can create this collective impact. So now over to William Deck from Gautrain. Um, William, thank you. William, I know I said it before, but the Gautrain has become one of our, our, our members of the Shared Value Africa Initiative. William is the CEO. Before he was the CEO at Gautrain, he was also the COO um, at, at Gautrain. He's um, got a lot of experience in finance and um, has been actually, when you think about it, Gautrain is one of Africa's examples of the best PPP that um, has come out of this continent. So, so William, um, in closing, if you can maybe just sum up for us um, of the conversation today, we'll really appreciate it and thank you. Thanks for the intro, Tiki, but much more importantly, thank you for inviting me to join this. I think this has been the most valuable two hours, um, you know, just listening to, to this group of panelists, um, George, thank you for leading it so, so well, very astute questions. I just want to take a step back, though. You know, so when we at Hartrain joined um, the Shared Value Africa Initiative, the, the, the profit with purpose sort of headline to really resonated with, with, with us. Not that we're in it for profit, maybe competitiveness with purpose is, is would be better for us, but it but it, re, it resonated. And the way that George put it even more simply is growing better grain because you share with your neighbors. I can really, really relate, relate to that. And we all can. But the real question is what do we do about it? You know, and, and move the dialogue away from saying, yes, we all agree about shared value and the importance of it, but what we as as leaders and as organizations do. And that's where Mark came in and his sharing of 10 years of experience in, in, in this. And he made two points that, that resonate with me. The first is that it's got to be led from the top. This is not a, uh, an, an idea of saying, okay, shared value, let's create a position in the organization. Let's lump it with um, you know, a corporate social investment type, type thing. It's about, it's about leadership, it's a key part of leadership and I think we have to take that on very personally but with one add-on from from my side and that is that I think we all lead organizations that have incredible innovators at all levels so it's not about leading by dictating or saying this is our shared value system it's by leading and saying I want innovation I want re really great ideas about about how we as organizations can can innovate um, in creating shared value. And the second thing which, which which Mark said, which really I set up, was, was about the role of the role of government. Um, and I have very, very strong views about this, having come from a government background. It's not to regulate. I think governments love to regulate. Um, to, to me, it's about using two very powerful rights that are given and powers that are given um, by in a, in a democracy to government to government to say you are the people who will buy things on behalf of the people because they they public goods and you have the authority to license things and, and to create and to regulate markets and those and I think all the speakers who, who touched on this all are very clear that it's that's got to be exercised in a, in a just way, in a transparent way, in a, in a clean way. But in the past 10 years, I have observed a change in government, certainly here in South Africa, that's 
become more nuanced and more aware of, of those powers and how they should be used. And I'm going to give you a simple example. Back in the day, I, I was in National Treasury. It was at the time when the, the, the concept of IPPs was taking hold, and especially in the renewable space. And the debate was about whether there should be more bidding parameters for bidders to meet bidding criteria other than price. And some very good, honest people, you know, sort of top economists said, no, it's all about the cost of electricity. We want lowest cost. Don't burden this with other, with, with other complex, com complex issues. And they weren't malicious. They, they just said the public good is electricity and it must be as cheap as possible. And I'm glad to say that that has changed. And I think that the renewable energy program really is a trendsetter. I was looking at some of the statistics that, that come out of it in terms of um, how ownership is shared, that it's not um, William Price and, 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 and his company and L that own things. They share ownership with communities. It's not about old mutual, which um, Ian, you didn't mention, I think you are one of the largest investors in, in renewable energy in, 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 in the country just invest to make um, uh, financial returns on it. But apparently there's something like 10,000 education opportunities that have been created through the program. So, so all of a sudden government by enabling the buying of electricity has also created social benefits. And through that, the ownership, the community ownership that comes from this and the community benefits that come from it, I'm telling you those renewable energy projects in South Africa are loved by the communities because that's where the employment comes from, that's where the ownership and the benefits come from. If I can then turn to the transport industry where, where I am, we're facing a massive problem. I saw one of the comments on the chat was saying, why is transport in such a mess? I'll tell you why it's in a mess is because transport is not owned by the people who use it. Stations are vandalized in South Africa because the people don't own stations and they see more value in the copper or the bricks in the station than they do in a functioning transport system. Now, creating a sense of joint ownership, employment opportunities is really, really critical. So this is where sort of I have to put my hand up as a, as a CEO and say, what are we going to do about that from a hot train point of view? And, and sort of hopefully this would lead into further discussions about how we do it. But the three um, requests that I've made to our team, as we look to 2026, when the current hot train concession comes to an end and we get the opportunity to redefine hot train, I've said there are three things that, that I'm going to set as parameters. The first is I want community ownership of the station precincts. We want to run a rail service, but I also want the precinct around it to be safe, to be secure, and to benefit the people who live next to, next to the stations. The second, I don't want to own any more buses. We'll run a rail service. We want to contract with SMMEs, with taxi associations, with small bus fleet owners, to move people to and from stations. We want to become part of a transport ecosystem um, and be much more inclusionary in our, in our contracting one. And the third commitment is that we want to run green energy stations. Um, we're going to explore how we do this. We obviously want to take advantage of the best technology that, that, that we have, but we want to reduce our carbon footprint even, even further. So Tiki, I hope, I hope that helps in terms of, of, of wrapping up. I also hope it also helps in terms of putting some concrete um, commitments on, on, on the ground. And I look forward to, to discussing this further with everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, William, uh, for those um, succinct words of wrapping up today's um, discussion. And 
With that, we conclude today's CEO Connect. I'd like to just very quickly thank all of our speakers and our panelists, you know, leaders from within the shared value community around the continent, as well as Mark Kramer for our keynote today, and of course, Dr. George Njenga for leading the program today. And thank you to you all for joining us and we look forward to hosting you at our next CEO Connect, which will be taking place on the 30th of September, and we'll be sending you more details in due course. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day evening, afternoon, wherever you are.